This topic is on type 2 diabetes and it follows the NICE guidelines of 2019. Type 2 diabetes is a chronic condition categorized by high blood glucose. Symptoms of diabetes include polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and recurrent infections, although these are more common in type 1 than type 2 diabetes. You should suspect type 2 diabetes when there is persistent hyperglycemia, which means HbA1c of more than 48 millimoles per mole, or 6.5% or random plasma glucose of more than 11 millimoles per liter. You should also suspect when there is characteristic features such as thirst, polyuria, blurry vision, weight loss, recurrent infections, and tiredness. You should also suspect type 2 diabetes in patients with risk factors such as strong family history, obesity, or ethnicity like Blacks or Asian family origin, or if there's any evidence of insulin resistance such as acanthosis nigricans. Diagnosis of type 2 diabetes include measuring HbA1c or fasting plasma glucose levels. For asymptomatic patients, you will need at least two abnormal HbA1c or plasma glucose levels, while a symptomatic patient will only require one. HbA1c is considered abnormal when it is more than 48 millimoles per mole or 6.5%. Use fasting plasma glucose if using HbA1c is inappropriate. A fasting plasma glucose of more than 7 millimoles per liter is considered high. There are a couple of conditions where measuring HbA1c is inappropriate. These include age less than 18, medications that cause hyperglycemia such as steroids, or patients with HIV or end-stage renal failure. Complications of type 2 diabetes can be classified into complications of the disease itself and complications of the drug treatments, which I'll go through later on. Acute complications include diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, and hypoglycemia. We should see diabetes as a vascular disease. Chronic complications can be classified into macrovascular, such as stroke and MI, and microvascular, such as retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Lifestyle management is very important for patients with type 2 diabetes. Offer an education program such as Desmond program. Promote good diet by encouraging low glycemic index sources of carbohydrates. Also encourage at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity in a week. As diabetes can cause other vascular complications, reduce patients' cardiovascular risks by offering smoking cessation services as well. The step-by-step -step treatment of type 2 diabetes can be quite daunting, and I personally don't think you need to know and memorize all the steps. The most important thing is to know the mechanism of action of the drug classes, examples in each drug class, and the important side effects as well. The first-line drug management is to start metformin, and if this is inadequately controlled, with a HbA1c of more than 58 millimoles per mole or 7.5% or higher, the next step is to add on one of the following four options. DPP4 inhibitors, pale glitazone, sulfonylurea, or SGLT2 inhibitor. If this is still uncontrolled, NICE guidelines recommend triple therapy as shown here or and insulin-based therapy. The next step would either be metformin plus sulfonylurea plus GLP-1 agonist, or to refer to the specialist if the patient was on insulin-based treatment in a previous step. Remember to always check for drug adherence before moving on to the next step and encourage diet and exercise. Target HbA1c should be 48 millimoles per mole or 6.5% and lesser if patients are only managing the diabetes with diet and exercise or with medications that do not cause hypoglycemia. If patients are on drugs that do cause hypoglycemia, aim for a target HbA1c of 53 millimoles per mole or 7%. It's important to know the mechanism of actions of drug classes, examples, 
and side effects of diabetic medications. The first drug class is biguanide, and the only example is metformin. This is an oral medication that increases insulin sensitivity and decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis. Patients may experience weight loss, and metformin does not cause hypoglycemia. Other side effects include GI disturbances and may cause lactic acidosis, especially in patients with low EGFR. Examples of DPP4 inhibitors, which are also known as gliptins, include citagliptin, and it increases incretin secretion. This has no change in one's weight and does not cause hypoglycemia. Side effects include pancreatitis. Thiazolidinidiones, such as pioglitazone, increase insulin sensitivity, adipogenesis, and fatty acid uptake. It causes weight gain and does not cause hypoglycemia. Side effects include heart failure, osteoporosis, and an increased risk of bladder cancer. Sulfonylurea, such as glycoside, increases insulin secretion by beta cells. It causes weight gain and can cause hypoglycemia. Other side effects include hyponatremia. Sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, which are the glyphlozins, inhibit glucose reabsorption in the kidneys. So naturally, patients will pee out more glucose and hence increase the risk of UTIs. It causes weight loss and does not cause hypoglycemia. GLP-1 agonists like axanatide is delivered subcutaneously and they are incretin mimetics. It causes weight loss and does not cause hypoglycemia. Side effects include nausea and pancreatitis. Lastly, insulin is delivered subcutaneously as well and it causes weight gain and thus cause hypoglycemia. Other side effects include insulin lipohypertrophy at the site of injections. It's important to know which drug class causes hypoglycemia as this can be fatal. Recognizing hypoglycemia is crucial for doctors as well. Signs and symptoms can be classified into autonomic symptoms and neuroglycopenic symptoms. Autonomic symptoms include palpitations, tremor, anxiety, sweating, and hunger, while neuroglycopenic symptoms include confusion, slurred speech, disorientation, loss of consciousness, and seizures. Do note that some patients can have impaired awareness to autonomic symptoms. These patients usually have type 1 diabetes, have frequent hypoglycemias, or are on drugs like beta blockers. Diabetes is a chronic condition, and it's important to monitor and review these patients regularly. At each review, assess patient's BMI, check patient's mental health, check smoking status, and measure HbA1c. Don't forget to assess for complications as well. Macrovascular risk factors can be stratified with Q-risk scoring. Remember that for patients with hypertension, the first line for antihypertensives is ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, regardless of age or ethnicity. Ensure that patients have regular checks of their eyes and feet, and to perform a protein-creatinine ratio to assess for nephropathy. In conclusion, you need to know when to suspect type 2 diabetes, how to diagnose, understand the complications, know the drug classes, examples, mechanism of actions, and side effects of them, and to understand the importance of regular review of these patients. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe for more.